Hello, Mountain West. To those of you gathered in the building, those gathered around the world, thank you so much for being here with us today, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And I hope, however, you were able to celebrate this past week. It was absolutely wonderful. And now, on our way to Christmas. So looking forward to celebrating uh, all December with you guys as we start sharing messages of hope, of the light coming into the dark world. And I tell you, we need that this year more than any other year. Hey, I wanted to introduce you to somebody. Several weeks ago, we had asked Angela if she would be able to come and Sharon, back then, we weren't sure if it was going to be an online service or if we were going to be able to have her in the building. Well, we're, we're thanking God that she was able to be with us. Angela is a corporate executive trainer, blogger, writer, speaker, mom, wife. I mean, the list goes on and on. I know you're going to enjoy what she has to say today. But more important than all of that is she's family. She's a follower of Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father. She's a sister to us, and we are incredibly thankful for her. So she's going to share with us. But if you will, I know we've, Leron just prayed, but if you will with me, let's pray over Angela for the Holy Spirit to just work in her and speak through her today. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to share this stage with your daughter, and Lord, I pray right now, may your Holy Spirit just anoint her, speak through her today, right into our lives, Lord, and may your word challenge us, may it transform us. We love you. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mountain West, would you welcome amen. Angela? She speaks amen. to us today. Thank you, Pastor Michael. Good morning, Mountain West family, and that word means so much to me, particularly in this season, but specifically in this house. My husband, Patrick, is here with me today. I'm so thankful. My, our sweet boys are at grandmother in loves, maybe watching mom, probably battling reindeer that she has positioned strategically at her home. I'd say they're battling reindeer, but hello to our boys at home. We have a picture of my family. I, I brought a picture to share with you all, but they are just my lights. I absolutely adore them. And speaking of family, it's a family affair because I, as Pastor Michael said, I'm family here with you all, but not just today. I've actually come to Mountain West a few times in the past and that was at the invitation of my brother in love. You all know him as RJ. I call him Raph. I'm the only one in my family that calls him that, so don't try to take it. I call him Raph. But he's my brother in love because his, my best friend I met in college, his beautiful and brilliant wife, Joy, was also my college roommate. And they, the Ferrells, are here today just to love on me as well as they support me uh, here with Mountain West family. And it, if you're making those connections, yes, I married Joy's brother. So my husband, Patrick, is Joy's brother. So it is a big old family affair. Our boys that you saw earlier on the picture, they absolutely adore their children, Parker and Michael. I see little Michael here in this service today. I'm so blessed to have you all here. I love being amongst family. And family, the holidays, it all evokes emotions in all of us, right? Feelings of nostalgia, it's nostalgia from when we were children, seeing those Christmas lights, smelling all the food that y'all ate. I know many of you may still be full from last week. I'm gonna pinch one more day out of that food. One more, I, I can't bring myself to cook or bring anything new. We're gonna finish off what we started from last week and get full <laughs> off of those leftovers. Tonight, one last dinner, one more time. But even the smells, and I have to think about even my not so favorite, the fruit cake. My father loves Claxton fruit cake. If many of you love fruit cake, you are right there with him. But those foods and those things really spark just the days of old from when I was a child. And the holiday season seems to really do that. Our boys love the holidays just as I did as a child. And when you become a parent, seeing the holidays through your child's eyes, it does something to you. It brings back that childlike wonder that we all had at some point. But also during this time, it can be bittersweet. Loved ones that are no longer with us, 
that had those traditions. Even in the times that we live now, being physically separated, having Thanksgiving connections over Zoom. I know I had to do that with my family this year, and thank God for technology, we were able to do that. So no matter what end of that spectrum the holidays bring for you, you know, feelings of joy or feelings not so much of joy, we all can agree that this has been a time that has truly bound us in more ways than one. And as I was thinking about our time together today, it made me think and reminisce about growing up in my home church. You may catch it throughout our time together, but I am from rural South Georgia, i.e. the country. (laughs) And when I say rural, there was rural route, so double R's in front of the number of where my childhood home was. So it wasn't even a real address. It was just outside the city limits, rural route, they'll get their mail and packages at some point. So growing up in the country, you know, you don't even need a farmer's almanac to know what crops are in season. You just gotta open the window or step out on the porch and yep, sunion season. Up, oh, yep, corn is ready. And then I also grew up near people who raise hogs and horses as well. So I'll spare you the details on what that smelled like in a hot Georgia summer. It wasn't pleasant, but reminiscent for sure. But when I think about my upbringing and knowing the fact of what seasons were happening, not simply because the weather changed, but because of what crops were being planted and the farmers knew to get the best out of the soil at those certain times, what they needed to do to create the best crops or to yield the best harvest. And I also think about how that connects to us. And when we talk about harvest and fruit, there are so many connections in the word around foods, such as crops and such as fruit. And I really went in deeper as I was thinking about what to speak to you all today about of what the significance of that means. And I was brought to, I'm bringing something from home to you all today. I was brought to my Red Book hymnal. Anyone have one of these? Maybe if you're at, yes, Red Book Hymnal. If you're at home, you're probably positioned somewhere where you're close to yours, but there's nothing like having this good old Red Book Hymnal. And I remember being so excited to receive my copy as a child in my church. And I've gone through a couple since then, but there was just this sense of ownership of being able to have it and knowing that this is a reflection and example of where my relationship with Christ began how it began around my love for song and music and watching my grandmother, who was our lead pianist and vocalist, sing those hymns like no one else could. Seems like all the women in my family could sing them like no one else could because it came from such a deep place. So as I was thinking about the theme and the thread that I wanted to tie into the message today for us, it led me to page 359, blessed be the tie that binds. And if you know that old hymn, you're probably already singing it in your own verse too. But if you don't, I'm gonna make you a little familiar with it today. I'm gonna read the first verse for you. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. I am a singer It is hard to read lyrics when I really just want to bust out and belt it, but I know I'm in a time frame today, so I won't get us started. But blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. So that's what I'm going to center this message around is what ties truly bind us together now that we've experienced life apart? We've been apart for a while now, you all, and I'm so thankful to be with you gathered in this house together but nicely socially distanced. We know what it's like to be apart, but what can we commit to and focus on to keep us together and to keep our connection to our one true source? I'm gonna take us to our first scripture today, which is from John chapter 15, verse four. And it says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Let's stick right there talking about fruit and the reference that the scripture gives us there. Another reference from back home, and I'm gonna take y'all to South Georgia with me today, so just sit tight. You're gonna have to Google some references, say what'd she say, how'd she say that, and what kind of word is that? So just bear with me, stay with me as we go on a journey. 
But back in that cinder block church positioned on a hill, white, painted white with a steeple, we fellowshiped in Christian love. That church was founded on family. And when I say family church, I mean family church. April 4th, 1888, my ancestors said, this is holy ground. We will worship God here in this place. And they didn't get to see me, but I know their prayers have prevailed because the love that I still have for my home church, it still remains true. And so from generation to generation, my family was reared around the legacy of church and that foundation and showing Christian love and giving. And one of the things that the deacons and the deaconess board, deacon and deaconess board, write that one down if you're not sure, but deacon and deaconess board, they did every year on the, for the Sunday before Christmas, they would have these Christmas bags or Christmas sacks. And that's literally what it was, a brown paper sack. And it was filled with fruit, apples, oranges, and perhaps depending on the time, there was maybe a peppermint stick or peppermint candy, as we called it, or penny candy. Now, if you grew up in the country, you know penny candy was the, penny, the candy that you got for one cent around the corner at the store, penny candy, unmarked, so butterscotch discs, cinnamon discs, and those little strawberry candies that no one still quite knows the name of, but they're really good when you're hungry in church. So they were in the bag along with nuts. Pecans were big where I'm from, so either pecans or walnuts or peanuts. But that bag symbolized so much more than just the modest things that were put in there. Because many of you are thinking, okay, fruit, some candy and some nuts, what's the significance there? That's not a gift. For many people, it was. I vividly remember my father reflecting one holiday season around the bags. I was excited to get them. I loved fruit and I looked through for the candy. I, I was excited to get them. But he shared that how far he's come through the grace of God to be able to provide his children gifts that they need, but also things that they wanted because he didn't have that same luxury growing up as a child. Those the Christmas sacks that came from church people that would deliver them to his neighborhood and to other children, that sometimes was the only thing they got for Christmas. And they looked forward to those sacks. So those Christmas sacks, they weren't just about the fruit and things inside. They were symbols of love, of Christian love and Christian giving to those that either didn't have or just weren't able to provide for others. So when I think about those sacks, I think about the fruit that was in there. And when I think about fruit, I think about how it grows and how we call my children to say fruit flies. I ate so much fruit with them when I was pregnant with them. That's an appropriate name to call them, fruit flies. I can't seem to keep enough fruit in the house. But I also think about the process of how fruit is yielded. And I landed on talking about or thinking about the muscadine. You're probably saying, say that again, Angela, the muscadine. If you're not familiar with the muscadine, it is a big old country grape that grows in the hot Georgia sun. It doesn't need much maintenance, but I call it a big old tough grape. And it's got tough texture on the skin, but boy, when you have one, you won't forget what it is. So my grandparents, they had a backyard that backed up to a wooded area that my cousin and I, we were always at my grandmother's house. We called it the Enchanted Forest. And right there at the entrance of the Enchanted Forest was this big arbor. And you guessed it. What covered the arbor was a muscadine vine. I mean, this thing was big. We ate off of it. Neighbors ate off of it. If you wanted muscadines, you were more than welcome to pick them from that vine. And as I looked at it as a child, I thought it was just really intricate because the vines just didn't grow straight and curve over and go down naturally. Muscadine vines, they twist, but they also have to be trained to grow that way. They have to be trained to grow over and to grow down. So that meant my grandfather and my grandmother, they knew that not only did the vines need to be trained, but they also needed to be pruned at certain points in the season. But that vine can't grow by itself me as a child picking those muscadines off, not even thinking about washing it, and we ranching it off. If you're from the country, you'll understand that. But didn't even think about washing it off, but knowing that it was sweet, 
It was tended to by my grandparents, and I really enjoyed eating them. But when I thought deeper about that reference, it reminded me that muscadines are resilient. They are a tough grape. I told you that's what I call them, and that's what they are. They're a tough grape. They grow from not the best soil, but if you just give them time, they'll yield something real good for you. But the critical pieces to that are the fact that the vines are the ties to the fruit, to the root, and the root to the tree. No fruit is produced without the vine, and the vine cannot function without the root. The vines are necessary. The vines are vital. The vines are like the veins that we have running through our body, but connected to the fruit-producing system. They are essential to the experience of what I was able to experience in reaping the sweetness of what muscadines were growing up. I want you to think about that part. What ties are essential to your experience in this life? What ties are, are essential to your experience in this life? But I wanna also take you to the other side of that spectrum. What ties are not essential to your experience in this life? And how do they even become a part of you or attached to you? And what are you gonna do to sever those? It's about commitment. It's about understanding the ties that are gonna yield results for us and fruit and the ties that we just need to disconnect from. So like the muscadine, we are to grow fruitful in our faith. And when we do that, growing in godliness can yield a harvest beyond your own self. I'm gonna take us to Deuteronomy next. So if you're joining me in your scripture, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five through seven says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So that context tells me that pretty much everything you're doing, either the word of God should be on your lips, the word of God should be in your ear, the word of God should be on your eyes, you should be speaking the word of God, walking in it daily without ceasing. We talk about praying without ceasing, but also listening to the word of God without ceasing, making sure that there's action behind this commitment of loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your might. I love the fact that it says they're diligently teaching your children. Uh, we, every year around October, we put up our tree. We're not one of those jump the gun holiday people. Hear me out, just hear me out here. We put our tree up in October because we focus on more so the fall festive decor. So I get the fall leaves and fall orange, golds, cream colored ribbons, and we put those around our tree with pumpkins, and it's very fall festive is what we lean into. That stays up and through until about the week of Thanksgiving. In the week of Thanksgiving, we put on turkey with feathers, and our children, they put what they're thankful for on those feathers. So one feather will say, God, praise God, hallelujah. One feather will say, mama, one will say, daddy. One feather will say either steel or storm, whichever brother has that turkey and that turkey feather. But then I'm looking around the rest of the feathers that they did, and it, one says clothes, one says food, one says house, and then another one, it just said toys in big old bold letters, that one was the boldest. I was like, okay, but it said toys. But it showed me that in the midst of this season of being so close to them, because Pastor Michael was so kind in all his words of everything I do, but I'm also the in-home teacher, the in-home mom there with the six-year-old who was doing the digital learning for first grade, and then my four-year-old who does online preschooling programs, it's a lot. It has been a lot for all of us in this season. And when I think about how I hold myself each and every day to the point of what I need to say, does it reflect God? What I'm doing with my children, is this reflecting God's love? What I'm saying, what we're reading, what we're doing, 
That testament through what those babies wrote on their feathers, it blessed my heart so much because it showed me that in the hard times, Angela, you're committed to what you are to do, and that is raising children that love me and love my word. So I'm so thankful that they were able to minister to me in that childlike moment. But it also showed me that what we reap, we sow. What we speak, what we're listening to, what we're reading, what we allow to influence us is what also we reciprocate out. What have you been listening to while you've been home? What have you been reading? What have you been allowing inside of your temple? And as a result of that, what is yielding? Is it fruit of God or is it something that he doesn't recognize? Let's take it back to the vine and the stem. Whether it be a vine or a stem, fruit grows from a rooted source that is connected to, that it is connected to in order to grow. So if you take that muscadine vine and you cut it from the root, from the source, is it going to yield those muscadines? It's not. Any fruit-bearing tree or plant, if you cut it from the source, it's not gonna produce anything, not anything of value and not anything of worth. But when you're connected to the source, the source that provides those nutrients, it's able to grow and thrive and flourish. Who are you connected to? Who's your source? Who are you rooted to? And when I think about that word root, I don't just think about it in the form of illustration with fruit, but also in our lives. What are your roots connected to? Dr. Henry Louis Gates, some of you may know him from his show, Finding Your Roots, but he's also a Harvard professor, very scholarly, and a large body of his work is based around genealogy and ancestry. And the premise of the show is to take you know, influential people such as celebrities, uh, dignitaries, and he digs through their family lineage to show how they're connected to other people. I absolutely adore it. I'm a fan of his work because I truly believe the more human connection we can understand from each other, the closer that brings us together, that tie that binds. And so well beyond the time of finding your roots and knowing even who Dr. Henry Louis Gates was, I have to credit my love for this historical quest to understand more about not just my family, but people. I have to credit that to my mother. As a child, even as a teen, I would accompany my mother going to various courthouses back in our rural county. We would go from county to county, courthouse to courthouse. We would search through different court records. We would even go to cemeteries, y'all. Some of you are like, wait, what? Say that one more time. We would go to cemeteries, and if you're not familiar, cemeteries can be a documented source of finding your roots and connecting the people that are in your family line. So we would go, and years and years, my mother would do these things, and ultimately, she was able to trace our ancestry back to our enslaved ancestors. I've been so proud of her for accomplishing that. This is well before Ancestry.com, well before 123, you and me, all the other ones that exist. She did the work to yield the benefit, to making the connection to see who are we connected to? What was part of our root process to see all the vines and branches that have extended from there with her children and now her grandchildren? And so when I think about that, I think about the fact that connectivity matters. Your roots matter. I took multiple strengths personality assessments in recent years, and Strengths Finder is one of them, and they identified me as a connector. And I saw that result in the report, and I said, well, gosh, tell me something I don't know. Duh, I know I'm a connector. I love people. I always have. I, I, my mother never meets a stranger, and neither do I. I got it honest, for sure. You can imagine all the times my dad has just sat somewhere while my mother and I are talking to a perfect stranger, and he's thinking, okay, how long is this one gonna last? But I'm a connector. I didn't need Strengths Finder to tell me that. That's how God hardwired me. How has he hardwired you? What did he instill in you at creation that is so uniquely you 
you don't have to emulate someone else. You just gotta tap into what he's already provided you. So when that report was revealed, revealed to me, I didn't, it didn't come as a surprise. What I did do with those results is take a chance to really dig deep in my past and find that thread of where I was being leveraged as a connector to other people. From when I was put on platforms in that cinder block hot summer day church back in my old town, and before I could even put together sentences, they had a microphone and I'd said, Happy Easter Day or Merry Christmas. I didn't realize then that what they were preparing me for was to do the things that I even do today. Or my second grade teacher, Miss Ruthie Mae George, who saw in me my gift of connecting and communicating. So teachers, that student that maybe talked too much, there is a career path for them. <laughs> there is hope ahead, parents. But she saw the gifts that God had given me and on her own money and on her own time and on her own dime, she took me to oratorical speaking competitions where she was able to grow and cultivate that in me with none the less than Psalms 23 and Psalms 24 that she particularly picked out for me, not only to compete with an oratorical speaking competition, but also to show that you should minister and minister, child. And that I have done. And I thank her so much to this day for that, for her time that connected us to even this moment here today. So my question to you with those examples, what are you committed to staying connected to? What are you committed to staying connected to? As I mentioned earlier, we have been separated by so much this year. You gotta commit to something and stay connected to it. Connectivity has been critical for us. For years, we've been able to go as we please, move and groove, do all the things together and fellowship in that way. We've had to be creative this year. We've had to really lean into technology. And as someone who works from home with students at home on multiple devices, Wi-Fi has been more important now than ever. And y'all remember those storms a few, month, few weeks ago, maybe the top end of last month or so, that took all the power out? Yeah, they took the Wi-Fi with it too. <laughs> Lord help me is what was on my lips that day. Because you see, if I don't have Wi-Fi, I can't connect to people who, I, who are entrusting that I'm able to share content with them and messages with them and to do my job. But my child can't connect to his teacher to get the information that he needs and to reciprocate what he's learned to her. It matters in this season of working from home. So with that understanding of how connections matter and we've needed to lean into things such as Wi-Fi more than ever, when life screeches to a halt, whether that's a power outage, whether that is COVID-19, when life screeches to a halt, what are you committed to, committed to say connected to? We don't know if something like this is gonna happen again in the future. What we do know is who holds the future. Are you gonna commit to him and trust that he has already orchestrated on your behalf, on the good of your behalf that he has for you? Or are you gonna panic and run like everyone else? Are you committed to staying connected? This idea of community, it's nothing new to God. It's nothing new to God. Community comes from a sense of responsibility that we have for each other. God encourages us to take care of our brethren while following the word of the Lord. We must remember the importance of maintaining connection with our fellow man to ensure a thriving community even when things are halted, even when it appears as there could be another global shutdown, even when things resume in a reminiscent way of what we may call normal. Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. This has been that time. How brotherly or sisterly have you been to others in the midst of it all? Because that's what we're called to do, y'all. The word says it. It tells us that. The fellowship of kindred minds to like that above. Keep that theme, the ties that bind us together. And speaking of calling, that's my second question to you. 
So we talked about what are you committed to connecting to, but are you committed to your calling from God? Some of you this season has been, has given you a lot of time. You've been given a lot of time at home or wherever you've been staying. But in that time, what have you heard? And what are you clear on when it comes to your purpose and your clarity and your calling? For me, when I look back, and this is a phrase from back home that the elders used to say, when I look back and take inventory, I never really stood what that meant, understood what that meant as a little girl. Now that I've gone through some things, oh, I understand that phrase good and well. But it says, when I look back and take inventory, and this year I've been able to do that, but as I look back, what am I noticing? What are those things? And for me, it was the fact that I've always been called. I know I have. I just chose to answer it my own way. And when I think about that, I think about one of the most revolutionary devices of our time, the mobile phone. I grew up with a rotary. Anyone else grew up with a rotary dial? Yes, I'm, I'm on the hunt for one just to kind of put it and say I have one. But an old rotary, and to show my children because they're probably thinking, what is that? But an old rotary. And the phone, when it first came out and what we knew it to be used for, to do two things. You make a call and you end a call. You make the call and you end the call. That's what my grandparents would say. You just make a call and you end a call. What's all the rest of the stuff that the phone has to do? But the mobile phone has really revolutionized what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. You can end a call. You can begin a call. You can send a call to voicemail. You can listen to that voicemail without the person you or you're listening and have that voicemail saved, transcribed, sent to your email, and then deferred for later. The phone can do a lot. The power in your mobile phone is more than they had when they sent the first man to the moon. Y'all do know that, right? If you don't, fun fact for the day. But that is incredible. So when I think about your calling and that illustration of a mobile phone, how many times have you silenced God? How many times have you put your calling on mute to do something else? How many times did you delay that calling? I'm standing here telling you because I've done it. I'm not pointing a finger at you because, as my pastor says, I've got three pointing right at, back at me. I've sent God to voicemail. I'll, I'll get to it, Lord. Just let, let me figure this out. I, I know it's on my shoulders. A first-generation college graduate. You know, someone coming out of a small town, and I made it because I got out. You know, someone that is the product and the daughter of someone who struggled with alcoholism and growing up and seeing that, going to AA meetings and understand the weight and the chains that people have been bound to because of that. I know, God, I understand, I hear you. I'm gonna send you to voicemail, though. Or, hey, God, yeah, I I'm, I'm, I'm really just need you to come through for this opportunity. Can you just, you know, make this happen? using opportunity as an identifier. So I'm gonna just text you real quick, but you know, make it happen. I wasn't committed all in for my calling because I wasn't committed to him. Are you committed to your calling? First Peter chapter one, verse 13 through 16 says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope Hold on to hope. Put that right there in the forefront of your mind. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, which is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. There it is. It's right there in our text. It's clearly stated, but not easily executed. The enemy knows this. He knows it, he knows it good. He knows that our call to be holy is clearly mandated by God, but yet he uses little cracks and crevices to get in and to exist when we are not committed to that calling. 
in that verse, did you happen to catch the word obedience? That's a word some of us struggle with. And I don't find it a coincidence or a surprise that they use the example of obedient children for that. I was that obedient child. I had a brother and sister that were 10 years ahead of me. They were back to back. And then I came a little on later. But my brother often says, hey, you've had the golden years. You know, we messed up, made mistakes, and paved the way for you. And I said, I'm thankful. I said, I watched what y'all did, and I made sure to steer clear of that. I was the obedient child after watching and waiting. But I think about my own firstborn son, and he is so much like his mama. He has that tender heart. He wants to do things right the first way and just toe the line. But on occasion, he might, you know, drift a little bit over to the land of where our little four-year-old is sometimes, where, can you say that again? This, this right here? This line? Don't step across this one? <laughs> and I vividly remember those times, very few and far between, where my husband and I have had to correct him verbally. And that in itself of just saying, hey, you know that wasn't right. Why do you choose to do that that way? But the words in themselves were just as if somebody walked out to the muscadine vine and the tree behind it snapped a branch and was walking towards the porch. If you grew up like that, you knew what was happening next, right? But those words are that illustration to our son, but he is just obedient. And I don't find it a surprise that the scripture talks about obedient children because that's what we are, y'all. I don't care what your license says, how old you are. I don't care how old you are, adult, teen, tween, all these names, we're all children of God. We are all called to be holy. And in that, we have to adopt the mindset of obedience. Obedience is a discipline. It's a discipline. Some of you are super disciplined when it comes to your body. Staying fit, working out, kudos to you, I'm not in that club. I thank God for good genes and just trying to eat right and running after kids. But it's a discipline. It is a discipline. And when we choose not to submit to obedience, we create obstacles instead of opportunities. Opportunities orchestrated by God. Our own disobedience is a barrier. Our own disobedience is a barrier. I think about a wall coming down. And it's something that I created because I wasn't obedient. There's a saying back home that I can show you better than I can tell you, and I think God is the master of that. He can show you better than he can tell you. I can stand here all day. We don't have all day. But I, we, I can stand here all day and tell you about the goodness of God and how faithful he has been, not just to me, but to my family, generation after generation, of things that the enemy tried to use to take us down, whether that was alcoholism, whether that was poverty, whether that was abuse. I can stand here and say that God is good. And he has been good and he has been faithful. But he can show you better than I can tell you if you trust him. So are you committed to staying connected to the source? And are you gonna answer that call? We're not promised tomorrow. We are not promised this afternoon. So it should behoove us with the time that we have in this experience of life to be obedient to our calling and honor our God. We're not carbon copies of each other. We are cre cre creator crafted. We are handcrafted by the master designer. Your calling isn't gonna look like your neighbor's. Your calling shouldn't look like your brother or your sister's. You are uniquely and divinely made for God's purpose. Listen to what he's telling you. Listen to your calling hear from him, feed your body with his word, because the more you are here, the more you can hear him clearly. So my last question and point to you, I mentioned that obedience is a discipline. Second Timothy verse two, it was Second Timothy chapter two verse 15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth that 
right there is an example of your individuality. You present yourself to God, not a carbon copy, not a recreation. We have enough of each other. One is enough. God needs you to be you for the calling that he has destined for you to be. That's gonna take faith. So my question is, how does having faith make a difference in your life? Hebrews chapter 11, verse one through three says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Quite simply, that says, y'all, if God said it, I believe it. That was a song I used to sing as a little girl. God said it, I believe it. God said it, I believe it. I'm gonna take him at his word. He's got a great track record, y'all. If you haven't tried it, try Jesus. He won't disappoint you like this world will. He won't. So by faith, this is faith. By faith, we don't have to see the finished product to begin the work. The craftsman doesn't. When he picks out his wood, he doesn't see the finished product, but he keeps his eyes on the mission of creating it. We don't have to see what's around the bend to get to our destination. By faith, we don't have to know what the future holds because we know and trust the one who does hold the future. By faith, we can hear that diagnosis and choose to receive the final say from the Father. It is by faith we can hold on to hope. And when I think about hope, I ask you to hold on to that. I think about the words to the old hymn, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Anyone else remember singing that as a child? It made me happy because I liked the tune of it and the words sounded great, but I had to go through some stuff in my life to understand what that really meant. I wasn't talking about physical sight. The vision of what God gives us through faith. I've got LASIK, but that's way better than LASIK. I'll take God vision over that. It was there by faith I received my sight. It takes faith, y'all. It can be as tiny as a mustard seed, but it makes all the difference in your life. Faith accompanied by action. Faith can be measured through obedience. Obedience is the visible expression of invisible faith. Angela, I can't see it. I hear you. I'm here online. I'm here. I understand what you're saying. I can't see it. I'm just asking you to trust y'all. Trust God. Yield and surrender to him. We know what it's like to feel what it's like to be out of control of things. There's so much we haven't had control of things and you can't control everything. Trust God for the rest and for the future. And whether you can see it or not, you gotta know that he's working for your good. Jeremiah 29, 11, it vividly tells us that. He knows everything that is orchestrated for you because he has orchestrated it. You're putting more weight on you to try to figure it out and understand when he's like, just trust and rest in me, child. I got this. Some of you checked out this year. Some of you threw on the towel a few months ago. I'm asking you to pick it back up. I need you to pick it back up. Your family needs you to pick it back up. Generations beyond this moment need you to pick it back up. They need you to commit to your calling. They need you to trust God and they need you to see by faith. Yes. Do it today. Stay connected to community, y'all. Stay committed to your calling. Keep the faith and tether your life to Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you here in this day and this moment, not just on Thanksgiving, God. We thank you every day. We give you the praise. We give you the glory for what you have done in each and every one of our lives. Lord, we are not in control. We surrender to you today. We give you the authority to rule and reign over our lives. And Father God, lead us more and deeper into your word so that we can hear you clearly, to stay committed to our calling, to answer that call and stay connected to each other so that we can encourage, inspire, and fill others with hope. 
As Pastor Michael said earlier, we need it more now than ever. And we need you to show up and show out for your glory, Jesus. As we move into the rest of this holiday season, which will move us, Lord willing, into the rest of the end of the year, into a new year, Father God. But even if you don't do it into this new minute of this time right now, we yield and surrender to you. We believe in you and your word. We will commit to serving you. We will commit to our calling to be holy, not just for us, but for the generations that need us to do this today. We surrender and give it all to you, God. You are our way. You are our truth. You are our light. You are our hope. In your holy and matchless name, Father God, amen. I invite you to rise. Let's praise God with our voice and song from the wonderful team.